Uh, pretty good. Con I'm con considering the mileage. Considering <laughs> the mileage, exactly. I'm going to apologize in advance. If I start crying, it's because I've got to be one of your biggest fans. Yes. Okay. So that means you're you going to. <laughs> <laughs> Again, thank you for joining us on the Daily Dose of okay. Dallas today. Yeah. Um, my life has been changed because your wife bought you a camera. Yes. Uh -oh. My life has been changed <laughs> for a $12 camera. <laughs> and I always want to say that to you. Um, we, you've been in our industry for over 50 years. And it's, it's going to be almost impossible to have a discussion with you within an hour. And, right. But we're going to give it a try. Yeah. Um, you have, like I said, you have been, again, thank you again. And you have been one of the most influential photographers in my life. And it's a joy and a pleasure to be able to speak to you. Yes. Like, I've always wanted to speak to Herb Ritz. I never had the chance. I want to speak to Abaddon. Never had the chance. Yep. You're the closest to these legends that I've ever gotten to. And so it's an honor to have it's you It's an honor to have you here. So when your team I said, yes, you do it, I had a moment. I cried. Uh -huh. And then I had to come back and say, oh, my God, he's really going to do this. <laughs> I am. So... <laughs> Enough about me. I have a question for you. Let's get it started. Um, your wife decided to buy you a $12 camera, and that changed your life. And it changed the life of the world of photography forever. How does she know to get you a camera? Well, I was already at college, art college. Doing, I had two years of art in art college where you did a little bit of everything. But the idea was you did a little bit of everything to find out what you loved the most and what you were good at. Mm -hmm. And after two years, uh, there, I decided to study graphic design. So when you look at a lot of my work, you can see that there's graph over a lot of it. Uh, and at that point, after two years, I had two more years specializing in graphic design. But for the first time ever, they had a photography course as part of the graphic design. So you had graphic design plus photography. And there was a very good lecturer came in. And at the same time, that's when m my wife got me uh, a very small, simple camera uh, because we certainly didn't have much money. And so I got a very small, simple camera. And uh, then I started doing photography course along with graphic design. And uh, that's where it really all started, right at that point. And when I got a camera in my hand, uh, I was really totally comfortable with it. You know, I, I, it felt, uh, I'm, I'm going to use a word that's not quite correct, it felt easy. Now, <laughs> I say, I mean easy, I mean it just felt comfortable, like a, like a, a good sweater or something like that, you know. Uh, and so once I got, I, I began to get used to it, and I began the journey with that camera. And uh, at that point, I began obsession. So the two things that you need most, in, in a way, is you need the obsession uh, and you need the passion. So the passion is you love it, you love it. And the obsession, uh, you become a photography workaholic. Uh, then you begin to really study how graphic design can help the photography, how art studying can help your photography. And then after four years at art college, I, got, I decided to, to put a film And uh, then I had three years of film school. Oh. Film school plus... Start a career. 
And then my wife heard So we all moved to Los Angeles. But that's when I really started. That's what we are. We're actually in, in Los, Los Angeles. Angeles right now. Oh, yeah. I used to be there. I was there for 76. Wow. So how did you, um, the differences in the cultures between the East Coast and West Coast, which drew you more into your industry? Because uh, there's, such, there's such a different culture to, on both coasts. To be, to be honest, it was where my wife got a teaching job. In other words, she got a teaching job in L.A., so got, guess what? We went to L.A. L.A., right, right, and, right. Uh, I just started trying to get a job there. I had a little portfolio, and uh, I got very lucky. Uh, I got in touch with uh, one person. I knew one person, and that one Los Angeles had a connection with somebody in Max Factor Cosmetics. Mm. And this guy who was in Max Factor Cosmetics, he was responsible for international advertising. You know, advertising in Europe, advertising in Japan, and all over the Far East, that kind of stuff. So I, I, I had an appointment with him. I went in to see him. I didn't really have any beauty shots, not right. really. And um, he said, I'll give you one hour. Uh, I'll, I'm going to book a model for you for one hour. And I'll give you some clothes from the closet here that were left over from other shootings. And he said, go and pick a model in the model agency and see what you can do. So it was, it was, it was fabulous that he paid for one hour. So, I mean, that, that was fantastic. And uh, so I went to the model agency, found a girl that, that I thought would be good. And then I spoke to the girl and said, how do you feel about if we didn't work for one hour, but we worked all day? and I'll give you some pictures for your portfolio. So she was happy to get one hour, but at the same time, uh, she was happy to work. And we started working at 7.30 in the morning and uh, we worked until eight o'clock at night. So we actually nice. basically pretty much solidly for 12 hours. I took the money I had and put it into film and I shot very five rolls of film and of course, uh, two days later, I took in the 65 rolls of film to the guy who didn't understand how I could do 65 rolls of film in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he looked at it, he didn't say much. And he said, okay, just uh, take a seat. I'm gonna show these to some other people. So apparently he went and showed it to different people at Max Factor. He came back and he said, look, he said, I have good news. He said, we're gonna buy five of these shots. So, I love this story. I was most worried about the money for the film and the process because that was virtually all the money I had, right? And he said, I'll give you a PO. I had no idea what a PO was, purchase order. Yes. Was. And uh, of course, when I got out of the building, I ripped it open to see how much money I was going to pay. And I looked at it and they said, oh, they pay me $150 a shot. So I thought, well, that's cool, $150 times five. Right. Made $750. So I thought, that is very cool. And I was most excited at the bottom said, plus expenses, meaning they were going to pay for the sandwiches that I bought people. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and they were going to pay for the film and processing. Nice. So I was really excited about the film and processing, and I was excited about $750. So when I got back and my wife was there, we borrowed a typewriter to type out a bill. And then when she was looking at it, she says, wait a minute. She said, this looks like $1,500 a shot. Now this is 1971. So you got to remember $1,500 in 1971 was a lot of money. And Even $150 was a lot of money. It's still a lot of money. And uh, so I was doing it. I said, wait a minute, that's $7,500. So at this point, I said, that's impossible. So of course, uh, I had a big debate for an hour with my wife whether we should bill it and chance our luck. Or she said, 
maybe if we do it, we'll get deported, you know? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, we're really only supposed to get $750, but we try to get seven and a half thousand. So I went in to see the guy. Uh, he called me in to get some more work. And uh, so I had to call him because I obviously it was, there were no cell phones back then. Of course. I call him. And he said, I've got another job for you that you could do. And so I was very excited about getting another job. Uh, and then I said, I'd like to speak to you about this, the money that you paid me for the last job, you know. And he, then he said to me, he said, well, he said, look, we only had seven and a half thousand dollars. <laughs> but I get you more next time. So, of course, at that point, I couldn't believe it. You and know. you couldn't correct them? Uh, no, no, I, I, I played very cool. You know, I tried to be cool about it. And I thought, wow. That, and, of course, I left, and I was like, oh, my God. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, I, I thought, God, do I love America, you know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, um, so the, the two things about that was, first of all, it gave me right away you know, some financial security because we had no money at all, right? And then he was giving me more work. Mm. And then because I was doing more work for him at the advertising agency that was responsible for Max Factor, the advertising agency called me to give me even another job, nothing to do with Max Factor, but other job. So bit by bit by bit, I got started, and um, within within a year, I had a I had rented a really nice studio on Santa Monica, oh. uh, and uh, it was uh, Laurel Canyon. And we know where it is. You know where that is. Well, if you yes. look, just come in a little bit on Santa Monica, and there's a totem pole there. And the studio I had used to be an Indian trading post. Wow. Coincidentally, which is a piece of trivia information, I went on after two years to buy a huge studio. So by this time we were really working and we had a lot of people working for us and I was working all the time. And we, we bought a building on Melrose. And Melrose at that time was very quiet. It wasn't a lot of shops or anything. It was a quiet street, a good street. And a friend of mine who was in my class at school called Tony Scott, right? The film director. I know Tony, yeah. Right? Um, whose brother is Ridley Scott, right? Yes. Well, Tony, Tony uh, took over the lease of that building the Indian Trading Post. Uh -huh. So he took over as his headquarters and after I did it. And then we moved to a beautiful studio building on Melrose. Wow. Uh, it just was fantastic. And um, that by that time, it was 1974. And three months after we opened that studio, I opened a very small studio in New York. So I had a big studio in LA, small one in New York. So two years later, 76, 1976, uh, we sold the studio in LA and I moved to New York. And uh, we, we bought a townhouse and, uh, and we've been in New York ever since. So that's uh, a total of what is that, 24, 45 years, really almost, 44 years. Ooh. Wow. Ooh. Um, did you know this was gonna happen for you? Like. When you did this shoot for Max Factor, did you know that was going to change your photographic life? Not really. And the best way I can give you, um, I, it's a very corny uh, analogy. It's kind of corny is good. Um, it was much more like you were on a ladder that was a thousand feet high and Every day, every week, every month, whatever it was, you managed to get up one rung on the ladder. 
So all you were looking at was the next rung of the ladder. You weren't, you weren't necessarily looking at the top of the ladder. You were just looking at the next one up that you could get, how could I get up a little bit? And then in 1974, I began getting calls from New York uh, from magazines like, you know, Harper's Bazaar. And, uh, I've heard of that magazine. <laughs> uh, I then, out of the blue, I got a call from them uh, from an art director there saying, we'd like you to photograph a, a, a celebrity. We'll tell you who it is tomorrow. They called me back. And it turned out to be Alfred Hitchcock, the director. And uh, One of my favorite photographs of yours. That was really the shot that changed everything for my career, was that when that shot appeared in the magazine, uh, then we just simply got a lot of calls from New York uh, to do different jobs and... Then I was working for Mademoiselle, and then I began two years later working for Vogue magazine. And then at that time, when I started working for American Vogue, then I got calls from Europe to work for French Vogue, uh, British Vogue, uh, German Vogue, and then Italian Vogue. So at that time, I was working for everybody. Lots of advertising. Wow, so so that, that's really the story. Wow. So let me ask you a question. You work for many different types of, many different countries of Vogue. And they have they all have their own aesthetic and they all have their own feel. Market. They only have the they all have their own market. Which was your favorite Vogue to shoot for? Um, it really depended on the individual job that you got. And sometimes you got a job that was like a, a road trip and you loved it because you were so free and it was a road trip and you could just travel and shoot and travel and shoot. So I kind of loved that the most if it was for you know, maybe the, the Italians. But then maybe I would spend a whole week doing the collections in Paris for British Vogue. And therefore that became a favorite thing to do. Being in the studio, working with different lighting systems, working against different backgrounds in the studio, and sometimes doing in the street in Paris at nighttime. That was cool. Um, so it really wasn't, there wasn't really a favorite favorite. Uh, and then I got a contract with French Vogue for three years to shoot every single cover of French Vogue uh, for three years. And that was a big deal back then because the photographers I was working with for French Vogue um, were the generation ahead of me. They were, believe it or not, older than me. And there were people like Elvis Newton, E. Bourdain, and people like that who were really amazing photographers. And forced and uh, various people that I, I met there that were very you know, interesting photographers. And they were all working for French book at that time. So uh, I didn't have a favorite to answer your question. Um, it really depended on the job, you know, what job, because there were good jobs for everybody. You know I mean? Uh, I, would, I would get a job to, from German Vogue to go down to Morocco, to Marrakesh and, and and spend, uh, you know, three weeks in Marrakesh um, shooting different models that would fly in. And um, then I, I spent a couple of days with Kate Moss that was early on in her career. And uh, uh, I did a very successful, you know, basically 14-hour shoot with her that was very successful. I, I, I bet it was. Some of our favorite photos. <laughs> Some of our favorite work. But our favorite model, Kate Moss. How was she work? How was it working with her? Um, she was fabulous. I mean, you have to remember, she was, you might say, of course, uh, a different Kate Moss to the Kate Moss you, you know today. Because back then, when somebody's starting out, they're slightly different to yes. what they become, and they change. And I don't mean they become more difficult or anything. I don't mean that because sometimes when you work with someone early in their career, like actresses or models, when you meet them again later, they kind of remember that you worked with them when they were starting out. So they, you kind of know that but people I worked with early on were like people like Sharon Stone. And, uh, you, you know, once you work with them, you spend two or three days with them. Then when you... You know, maybe two years later, you work with them again, and they're they're much bigger stars and everything like that. Uh, but because they knew you early on, they treat you differently to the people that's around them 
now as it were, you know. Wow. Uh, totally understandable. Kate, Kate was very nice. I worked for her 12 hours. And at the end of the hours, she said, uh, just to let you know, it's my 19th birthday today. So she had, she had worked with me 12 hours, didn't mention it was her birthday. And uh, then right at the end of the the day, about 8 o'clock, she, uh, she said, today's my birthday, you know. So she was pretty, pretty patient. Good. Good. Well, I'm glad she was. Yeah. You are one of the few artists that have shot completely different types of people. You yeah. shot supermodels. You shot rappers. You shot rappers. Actors. You shot rock stars. You yeah. shot directors. You shot Diana Ross. Yes. Yeah. Like, what was that like? Well, uh, it was kind of funny because I was a big fan of hers, but I was pretty cool. And then there was a funny thing. You guys will find this funny. Uh, she came to the studio, and of course, I, I had been photographing a, a lot of African Americans, which I love to do. Uh, because when you come in as a European, you come from a village in Scotland, you know, and you're 12 years old before you see anybody who's black, right? Think about that. You're 12. And, uh, and it's a funny story, actually. At the school, the village school we're at, um, the, the geography teacher says, we have a visiting teacher who's coming in to give you a talk. And they're from Nigeria. And we thought, oh, okay. We were 12 years old. And in walks this guy from Nigeria. And of course, he's, he's a black guy. You know, so obviously he's from Nigeria. And we were like, wow, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were all white as the driven snow, you know? And <laughs> Thing we remember about this guy was he came in and he was wearing a dark suit with a starched white shirt, a perfect knot in his tie. And the thing I remember to this day, he had a shirt with cufflinks in the shirt, you know, in, in there. Right. And we had never seen in our life somebody so well dressed. And we came to the conclusion that after he was giving his talk, he must have been going to a wedding or something. <laughs> <laughs> so I tell you that because, and it's an important story for me, because you understand when you come from that background, you have a different, you come into the American system, you have a different viewpoint. You, there, is no, there is no baggage. There right. is no, all, all I knew was, boy, did I love Chuck Berry and Little Richards, you know. Boy, did I love Motown, you know. Was I obsessed by Motown? Yes. I was almost as obsessed by Motown as I was with a camera. Mm, wow, that's a lot of perception, obsession. You know, and therefore, when you have this kind of adoration going, therefore, when, when I was then suddenly came in touch with photographing African-Americans, then it was like really, for me, exotic and fabulous. You know, I thought this is very cool. And also, I just found photographing African-Americans a really fabulous thing. I mean, I just found them electric to photograph. So uh, I, going now to answer the question with Diana Ross, she came in and on the walls, I had a lot of African-Americans in the wall. There was a lot of pictures like Bobby Brown, right? And there was other pictures like that. The back of Mike Tyson's neck was mm -hmm. there. Yeah, I know that shot. Yeah. So she, she said, right. So she had a bit of attitude and she said, right, I want you to put white towels. I don't want all of these black guys looking at me. From <laughs> <laughs> of course, that was a bit surprising to me. I thought, well, I thought she'd be impressed by these guys. But no, she didn't want them. She said, I don't want these guys looking at me. So I want you to put white towels over all these pictures. So the studio had white towels over all these pictures, right? And I thought, okay, this would be a bit difficult. And of course, we had done, we were always very careful with things like the dressing room. Like we had beautiful flowers in the dressing room. 
And uh, she came in and she said, I might be allergic to these flowers. Can you take them out of the dressing room? I said, okay. So we took them out. So you're getting the picture, a little bit of diva. Yes, yes. Just a little bit. <laughs> a little bit starting. And uh, then she, she spoke to me about what we're wearing. And I said, well, I just thought something a little bit kind of straightforward, maybe a tank top and a pair of jeans, right? And she said, yeah, that's fine. And she put on the tank top and the pair of jeans. And I said, you know, upstairs, I, I had bought, brought from Los Angeles, I had the most beautiful antique uh, American Indian belt, you know, with con silver conches on it. And I said, it just adds a bit of something, not just a leather belt, but with silver eagles on it. But right. Beautiful. And uh, she said, yeah, that's cool. I like it. And she was okay. Then this was where it all changed. We went down to the And I did the first polar. Back then, it's not digital, it's polar. So I did the first polar. And I wasn't sure I looked at the picture. And she said, all right. She said, what's wrong? She said, she told me, look, she said, what's wrong? I said, look, it's a little bit. I said, you know, and of course, here I said the right thing. I said, you know, for me, Diana Ross. So, of course, I started speaking to her like she wasn't there. Right, in the third person. Third person. And I said, you know, for me, Diana Ross is so kind of sexy. And this looks a little bit straightforward. So I was kind of honest. She said, mm -hmm. she said, well, maybe you're right. So she said, hold on. So she turned away from me and she took the T-shirt, the, the tank top, with the tank top, and she screwed it into a knot underneath the breast. So suddenly, in the first shot, she doesn't have any breast, but now she tightens the T-shirt and now she's got the, 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 the actual tank top becomes smaller and breasts can and I, I said, just imagine that you're performing and you just throw your head back a little bit to the light that you're in the middle of the performance. So I did another Polaroid. And I looked at it. I said, well, that looks better. And she said, well, she said, let, let me be the judge of you. <laughs> and I said, okay. So she looked at the Polaroid. And then she looked at it again, and her eyes went really big, you know? And she said, wow, like that, to the Polaroid. Okay. And then, something I'll never forget, she took my head in her hands, and she kissed me on the mouth. So nice. We, we went from, we went from, God, I hate the way the studio looks with all these people looking at me. And I don't like the flowers, and I don't like this, and I don't like that. And so we did that shot. So she goes upstairs, and she goes into the office upstairs after the shooting. And she then says to my wife, she said, right. She said, I want to book this guy for three days. So she said, I want to work with him for three days. When can he do it? Next week, and so on. So, uh, so that that was the the outcome of the relationship of that shot of of, of Diana Ross. And what the Lord really well, I told her there's a really fabulous little footnote to this story. Six weeks before I did this shooting. Diana Ross herself, before the shooting, which is for Rolling Stone, before the, Diana Ross called our studio. And she said, um, I want to book Albert Watson for one day to do a record for me. Okay. And how much money does that take to book him for a day? So, we gave the daily fee of how much we charged. And she said, well, that's a ridiculous amount of money. <laughs> she said, I'll give him half of that. And we said, 
We said, no, we're not going to do it. Good. Right? We're not going to do it. Okay. Now, here's the really fabulous part of this story. I was then, the following week after that, six weeks, five weeks before the story I just told you, I had to go to Los Angeles. Then after Los Angeles, I did a job in Las Vegas. Now, who was appearing in Las Vegas? The guy from... Mm, <laughs> let me guess. <laughs> So, this is what gets even funnier. The hairdressers who I was working with in Las Vegas, who came from New York, his uncle was the maitre d' at Caesar's Palace in the big room where they take place, the Diana Ross show. And so he calls his uncle and we get a table. So this is now four and a half weeks or something before my shooting that I just told you about. And gives us a VIP table, a banquet, right? Kind of in front of the stage. Right. And there I am sitting there watching the Diane Ross show in Las Vegas. So she does the whole thing. She does, she comes in, she sings, she's fabulous the dancers and everything, like Las Vegas. And then she starts a song and she says, I want to get close to you, she says to the audience. So she comes down the stairs of the stage and begins walking through, you know, there's tables everywhere. She begins walking through all the tables, singing the song, reach out and touch somebody. Reach out and touch right. somebody. She's walking through all the tables like this. And she comes randomly across our table just by, and I'm sitting at the outside of the banquet. And she kind of sits a little bit on the edge of the table and she turns to me. She takes my hand, reach out and touch somebody. Reach out and touch, right. <laughs> and she sings the whole song to me, the rest of the song to me. I'm oh saying, my God. She had no idea who we were. She had no idea that I was this photographer that was too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> okay? And of course, everybody is hysterical, laughing at the table. And of course, most of all, my wife, who of course knew the whole story that she had already said to Diana Ross, this is funny, of course. So, so the next thing was, uh, a week and a half later, then we get a call from Rolling Stone. Can you photograph Diana Ross? And then that fits another part of the story that I told you about. She came to the studio. And then the next thing was her best friend. And then I began doing a lot of album covers. And I did all of her, for the next concert tour, she did, did all of the, the programs, you know, and, and shots of her and so on, you know. Uh, so, uh, and I did, I did, I think, three other streams with her. So she was... She was fabulous. So I'm sorry it's such a long story, but it's a fabulous story. No, 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 no. We can Perfect. sit and listen to you for hours. Yeah. <laughs> I've been shooting, my anniversary of shooting was yes. on the 13th, and I've been shooting for 30 years. Mm. Wow. And yeah, right, wow. And one of the things that has always been a dream shoot for me is the Pirelli calendar. Yes. Oh. You shot an amazing... Everybody shoots an amazing Pirelli calendar. Yeah. <laughs> but what made yours so amazing is um, your story behind it, dreaming. How did you come up with that concept? Well, when I thought about what I was going to do, when I thought about how was I, you know, what, how was I, how was I going to do the Pirelli calendar? I thought the Pirelli calendar at the moment is. When I say at the moment, I mean for the past five years, for the next five years, is really locked into celebrity of some sort, somebody famous. You can't just right. you can't just go and pick a nice model and say, well, she's pretty. Let's do it. Let's let's take her. And also, Pirelli calendar changed the focus definitely over the past few years, where nudity in the calendar went out the window. Mm -hmm. Basically, no longer is the Pirelli calendar 
a pinup calendar. It's a right. photography calendar without nudity. So you can do somewhat sex shots, but you it wasn't like the ones from five, six, seven years ago. And going further back, there were just models and they were nude. You know, so right. we're into celebrities and how do you deal with that? Because of the celebrity issue, I decided to do it much more like it was cinematic, like it was cinema. And I shot it all, which was an idea I had, and turned out to be very, very difficult. Much more difficult than I'd anticipated to shoot it all white, almost like a cinema school format. So not panoramic, that's even wider, right. but fairly widescreen. And uh, to make it this idea of four women that were ambitious, wanted to do something with their life, that wanted to, and to play another character. Like Julia Garner, she wanted to be a famous photographer. And she photographed women, but she also photographed botanicals, you know, uh, plants, flowers, things like that. So each of the women, like, you know, Gigi Hadid, uh, Letitia Casta, you know, these, the, the idea, Letitia Casta played somebody. So each woman was played. Now, Gigi Hadid, for example, Gigi Hadid was playing what we thought was a rich woman, uh, like an heiress who had a penthouse in the Carlisle Hotel in New York, you know? And guess where we shot it? The penthouse in the Carlisle Hotel. <laughs> Carlisle Hotel. And also I wanted some strange things with Gigi that I said, look, maybe your best friend is somebody famous. So we chose Alexander Wang, the designer, who was her best friend. So the only person she hung out with, she didn't have a boyfriend at that time, you might say. And so Gigi Hadid was living in this penthouse. And the only person she saw was Alexander Wang, who she had dinner with and drinks with and went out to, on the town with and so on. So each of these things was about a fantasy of what am I going to do next? So Gigi Hadid was, what am I going to do next with my life? You know? And by Gigi, just broken up with a boyfriend and therefore fell into the whole plan of what do I do now, you know? And so with these, with these women, and also the final missing person was Misty Copeland, the dancer. The ballet dancer, yes. Who was beyond, she wasn't fabulous, she was beyond fabulous. Whatever the next one up from fabulous is, is Misty Copeland. The next one up from Fabulous is <laughs> Albert Watson. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> but with Misty, I loved her. And the idea of Misty was that she lived in Miami with her friend, maybe boyfriend, but maybe not, who was also a dancer. So we also chose somebody, both of them were ballet dancers, but they weren't yet famous. They were trying to be famous. So they were mm -hmm. playing character where they were trying to be famous dancers. But with Misty, for her to make some extra money, she danced in a strip club. So we actually went to a strip club in Miami, a real strip club. And we photographed her, of course, not really stripping, stripping. Of course. Pretending to be at the beginning of a dance routine. And of course, she loved it. Here she mm -hmm. is in classical ballet, but she's in a strip club. You know, we give her a platinum win. I mean, she was fabulous too. So each who came was, up with these concepts? Was it well, you? I, I came up with the whole thing. You, you, the photographer has to do it because if somebody yes. else gets, then it's going to feel like an advertising job. But if you come up with it yourself, then if people like it, then you know you you you, you take the praise of it. If people don't like it then you have to take all the criticism of it. So yeah. I think in the end, we actually attempted to do something that was highly complex, 
highly difficult to do. A vast number of images, uh, a total of 58 images in four days. Now, to do 54 images in four days, you, you, my photographers watch and say, well, I, I've done 54 images in four days. But you have to understand each of these images had to have some weight to them, power. It's not so easy to do 54 strong shots in four days. Right. And it's quite a mountain, even for me to do it. And I had a lot of experience. Uh, but in the end, I loved it. I loved the calendar. Um, the designer, Fabian Baron, did the layout of it. And he, he did it like a box. You know, it was a real box of, of photos. You know, and he, which came alongside with it. They, they did this beautiful black kind of steel frame, black steel frame, uh, that when you got the calendar, you would put the individual shots into this frame, you know, and you would change it per day. So we didn't, we didn't do it by month. We just took the total number of shots, which I think were 48 or something like that. Was it 55 shots? I can't remember the final amount, but we just divided it into days. So when you had the picture that it wasn't necessarily the month of February, it could have been right. a bit of in a bit of March and a bit of March and a bit of April. So it was it was overlapping and it was just whatever it was, you know. Uh, but it it was uh, it was pretty well done. It was, but uh, it it was not easy. But it was my own fault. That is crazy. Well, we're gonna hunt down this uh, Pirelli count. We're gonna hunt down your, your Pirelli count. We gotta get it. We have, to get we, have it. we have we have Herb Rich. We have Herb Rich. We have Richard Abaddon. Yeah, and we're gonna get you. We gotta get yours. yours. We gotta we find have it. to get we yours. So let's talk about some things. I've watched some of your previous interviews, and one of the things that they talk about is your diversity of genres. Yeah. And for you, they all interconnect. Can you touch on that? I think part of it was when I was in LA, and I had to, I did a lot of car photography out in the desert and in places like the Redwoods in Northern California and on beaches. So I was doing car photography, advertising, but I was in landscapes. So I really enjoyed doing that. So that was one genre you might say. The fashion genre connected to beauty and also doing nude photography. So doing nude, fashion, beauty, that all connected. I was always interested in still life. And I found still life's relaxing. You know, if you spend one month with models in, you know, New York, Paris, and London, you get home and you have one week of still life, it's a great relaxation. It's a bit like a Zen experience doing still life. You know? And when you're dealing with air, uh, temperamental editor, so on, still life, you know, the still life doesn't really give you you know, whereas celebrities, models, hair, makeup, you know, all of that, there's something else going on. So landscape, still life, fashion, beauty, nudes. And I even tried, which I regret not doing more of, I even did reportage. I went up at the end of the 70s and spent uh, 10 days at the Calgary Stampede photographing cowboys in India. Nice. And for me, of course, remember what I said about African Americans? Of course, going up in Canada and photographing a rodeo with cowboys and Indians was a, just an extension of, you know, you come from a, you come from a, a a village in Scotland and my father was obsessed by westerns and lots of times when I was a kid and he was taking me to the movies I would ask him what the movie was he said I have no idea but it's a western <laughs> <laughs> you know <clears throat> so to, to actually 
then and after being you know indoctrinated with dozens and dozens maybe hundreds of westerns it was very nice to go up to canada and then really photograph cowboys and you know they're at this rodeo and it was action and also it was touch so all of these things linked together and i like to think it's probably an exaggeration but i like to think that the the connecting factor is the whole graphic design cinema thing that that connects everything together it's the graphics in the landscape the the graphics still life and also sometimes even with the still lives some of it was not so much how beautiful the still life was in its photography but how was it you know how what concept did the still life have so when i went to more fine art still lives i began to become interested in objects that were connected to people and i spent two and a half years trying to get into the cairo museum to photograph the artifacts belonging to the common wow and it took two and a half years to get in there eventually i got in there. and a couple of years after that i got into graceland to photograph artifacts from elvis of his presley mm-hmm. of elvis wow so i then got into nasa to photograph nasa memorabilia space suits uh gloves space gloves space boots just space memorabilia so a lot of these things like i photographed neil armstrong the first man on the moon his space suit so that connected with elvis's gold lamé suit that he <laughs> and that also connected to the gloves of tutankhamun you know so that was just a whole that's it's not so much how good the still lives look they're they're straightforward they're like past but right. it's concept that's the driving force the idea to do it so there's still lives with an idea yeah. that's that, that there's there's something behind the still life there's been a major you have been around so long and you've seen so many changes in the industry in the industry with technology and all that and we went from film to digital to all these things but the magic of photography is still the print sure and i we we old school so we're all about the print how do you feel with this new genre of everything being disposable thrown on instagram and microwaveable and microwaveable um i i think you know life's a little bit like sitting in a car you go through life and you look out the window and you see the beatles then you see motown and then you see david bowie and then you see fashion in paris in 1960s and then the 70s and 80s and it's always changing so when you look at it the the advent of digital photography which i was suspicious of in the beginning because so, so was i the camera i found the cameras had one problem with me which i solved um was that there was a microscopic delay in the shutter when you hit the shutter that there was a delay that the camera fire best bigger cameras like a bees one cam- less with the smaller because that that was less of a problem but then of course with the bigger cameras that more like the Hasselblad type of cameras or phase 1 uh it, you just solve that by putting the mirror up. so when the mirror was up then the shutter was instantaneous which i was used to uh so when you hit the shutter that's when you saw the picture so if you're doing something like dance or movement or athletics you need an instant response when you see an image you can't hit it and i i noticed that when i was doing the first job with digital i was doing dancers 
And when I started looking at all the pictures, I was missing the picture. He was, he was always a little bit late. I, right? wasn't, I wasn't missing the picture. The camera was missing the picture. The camera was missing it. So th then we solved that by just putting the mirror up. You know? You and, gave us a hell of a lesson oh with that one God. line. Oh, yes, my God. God. You know? We so, should be in format. So uh, at that point, that was one thing that was solved. And in the end, you know, look, you, you're photographers, you, you spend your entire life looking at a rectangle. That's what it is. Right now I'm looking at a rectangle, you're in a rectangle. So when you compose something, guess what you're looking at always? You're always in a rectangle. It can yes. be a vertical, it can be a vertical, or it could be a square. But 99.9999999% it's a rectangle. And who you are is what you put in the rectangle. What's in that rectangle? What's the proportions, the, the, the lighting, the, the depth, the lenses, the, et cetera, et cetera. All of the things that come into play, the lighting particularly. Uh, so as far as looking at a film camera and a digital camera, to take the picture of the same, because you, if you, you want a magical picture and you've got a film camera, you want a magical picture. You've got a digital camera, you want a magical picture. Now, when you start tracing it, there is a beauty to film. It has a strange liquid quality. It has a, a great analogy. slightly different, you know? So I love it. However, I can also argue that digital offers me something as well. Yes. But being with film, for 40 odd years, that when digital came, I worked to embrace it. You know, I, I, I said, okay, no point in throwing it out, throwing it out. Then you become old. Because right. you, have, you have to be aware of what young people are doing and how they're doing. And, and which I've always said to young, I say this all the time to young people, you know, the, the 50s, 60s, and 70s were about music and fashion. These days, it's not really that much about fashion. It's about technology. Technology yeah. is the driving force. But to tell you what I really love with the digital revolution, I do like it that everybody takes a better picture now because of the iPhone. I like that, that, you, you know, that my uncle or, or somebody that's not a photographer can take a nice picture you know, of a sunset. And it looks good, and he can show it to me right away. You know, I, I, right. right. So I like that aspect of it. Uh, but to me, the thing that made the biggest difference, and I'm going to answer your question about a project, the thing that made the biggest difference is the computer and using Photoshop. Photoshop became, for me, because I had a, a gigantic advantage. Once you spend 40 years in a dark room printing on pieces of paper, and manipulating an enlarger, a piece of paper under an enlarger. And you work on that for 40 years, not five years, not 10 years, not 20, 30, 40 years. When you get in front of a computer screen, you actually have a big advantage because you have an analog mind and you're looking at pixels, yes. but you can really begin to battle out what and squeeze the hell out of what the computer can give you what the printer can give you and what you can arrive the danger for young photographers is that they get sucked into 999 things that a computer can do pictures and i'm fortunate i don't get sucked into all of these special effects and things like that which might well be valid but sometimes the special effects that computers give you, sometimes they can look a bit cheap and a bit superficial. And you can't argue that even superficial can have a point. You know, Andy Warhol would, would say that. Andy Warhol remarkably right. predicted the famous statement, you know, in 1964. He said, in the future, everybody will be famous, he said, for 50. But he said, in the future, everybody will be famous. Now you think about that today, everybody, you know, yep. all yeah. you have Instagram. So if you get the name, you go in and there they are on the computer screen 
and there they are in a phone. You might be in a coffee shop, but there's that person. And you're in a coffee shop, and that person might be in Japan or Paris, and there they are on your phone. They're famous, world famous, you know? So yeah, what, yeah. world famous. Wow. He predicted the idea of celebrity uh, and the importance of pop and superficiality. So therefore, some of the things in digital, the superficiality plays well into maybe the, you know, a lot of fashion photography today, some of it looks very lightweight to me, uh, but then you've got to be very careful with that. Because, um, it can look a little bit lightweight and student look that like it's done by a student, you know, and yep. it was done by, you know, uh, but yeah. it, 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 it doesn't have enough weight. But sometimes you could take one of those images and compare it with one of my images. And the comparison is my image might be heavier. It might be more like a piece of granite or a piece of, piece of stainless steel. But it could be to the masses that the lighter weight image has more appeal. You know, more, uh, and nowadays with Instagram, I can see pictures on Instagram that are quite honestly not very good pictures. But that doesn't matter. That's my opinion. The masses can like them. The yes. masses like those pictures. Yes. And you see that by, if you look at somebody, even with the Gigi Hadid, who's fam famous and fabulous who has 59 million, 59 million followers, right? And she posts a picture, not a very good one, of her pushing her new baby in, in, a, in a perambulator, you know, down the street, and she posts that picture. And 3.8 million people say, amazing incredible, outrageous, you know? And of course, the use of words doesn't matter anymore, you know? Right. Uh, you know, you, you could say, you know, a cure for cancer is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, but not Gigi Hadid pushing her baby down the street, you know? <laughs> um, so, it, the world has changed, you know? Uh, you can't look at it and uh, there's a little bit of the, the emperor's clothes. You know the, the old story of the emperor's clothes. Yes. The, this uh, trickster came in and showed him nothing and said, this is a beautiful suit, but only you, the, the, only the most intelligent person in the kingdom can see the suit. And he said, let me try it on. So, of course, he's nude. Of and, course. And uh, he's wearing what he thinks is a suit. But because he's the king, nobody says anything. They accept what he, that it's, he's walking around nude in, and he says, isn't this the most beautiful suit you've ever seen? Until one day somebody comes in and says, why do you not have any clothes for a child? <laughs> exactly. Of course, the whole thing comes crashing down. But, uh, you know, you, you, it could well be that Photographs now, the, the, the good news is that the photographs that I took or have taken can become classic and iconic. That's the good news. Yes. The, the bad news is because they're classic and iconic, they can be old fashioned because they're from another time. Exactly. The whole point about fashion is shouldn't fashion pictures from the 19, before my time, from the 1960s and 50s and 40s, they look a little bit old fashioned because part of the beauty of them is nostalgia. Exactly. So, so therefore, how do you position yourself? Do you follow the trends? And uh, for my next serious fashion story, should I shoot it on my iPhone? Because sometimes photographers do that 
And well, we're about to lose you. Yeah, right he's now. about to cut us off. We're gonna have to cut this short, Peter. What? I mean, I'm broke up. I'll be the Albert. <laughs>